ladies and gentlemen, uh, good good morning. I was thinking almost good afternoon, but good morning. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, this uh, is for us an important moment to, to address you, especially here in Frankfurt at the Motor Show, which has selected uh, a marvelous team uh, around connectivity, which is of course uh, top notch for our industry. Uh, and what we plan to do uh, throughout this press conference is really focus as well on how we can bridge this new technology with one of the other uh, challenges we have as, uh, as a sector in uh, addressing the challenge of, of climate change. Uh, and what is the contribution that uh, connectivity technology and particular ITS can, can bring to the party. Uh, and I think we are very happy that uh, we have uh, here with us uh, Herman Meyer from Ertico, CEO from Ertico, uh, who has been uh, very active over the past years in setting up all kinds of schemes and pilot projects uh, regarding ITS with a wide range of stakeholders, not only industry but also public authorities. Uh, and learnings, insights from these projects have been the basis for a, a study which we want to present to you today. Again, it's the right forum, uh, the Frankfurt Motor Show focusing on connectivity to do this. And so uh, we are proud to share with you this, uh, these data. Uh, but let me first of all give you the floor to our president, uh, Mr. Gore. Okay, uh, thank you, good morning and, uh, and welcome. Uh, the theme of this year's uh, Frankfurt show, uh, as you know, is Mobility Connects, which relates to some of the major technological challenges facing our industry today. Those include the connected car and more broadly intelligent transport system or ITS. Today I want to focus on one topic of particular importance, the potential of such technology to reduce CO2 emissions from road transportation. This is particularly relevant because in just over two months, as you know, the world policy makers will gather in Paris for the COP21 climate conference to set new goals toward reducing global CO2 emissions. Our industry has a strong track record and commitment to CO2 reduction. Uh, in order to meet the EU's targets, auto manufacturers have committed to ensure that by 2021, CO2 emissions from new cars will be 42% lower than they were in 2005. Yet, despite this progress in reducing overall road transport emissions is not keeping pace. Transportation is responsible for around a quarter of total greenhouse gas emissions. Of that, road transport represents about 18% of total emissions arising from the use of all vehicles on the road. This is why we as an industry are advocating a much more ambitious and comprehensive approach to reducing emissions. This means not only focusing on continuing to reduce emissions from new vehicles, but also looking at the factors that affect emissions during the use of the vehicles over their lifetime. These factors include the driver behavior, fuel options, fleet renewal, infrastructure, and the potential of ITS. My focus this morning is on the impact of ITS uh, uh, that it can have on CO2, the subject of an Ertico study that is being released here today. This study clearly recognizes the potential of ITS measures to help meet EU and global emission reduction targets as part of this more comprehensive approach. Effective ITS measures for cars include both in-vehicle and infrastructure systems. They can, for instance, help drivers quickly find parking spaces, avoid congested areas, improve fuel consumption. According to the study, the two most promising in-vehicle ITS applications are eco-navigation and eco-driving support systems. Eco-navigation systems are dynamic navigation tools that use real-time data to reduce fuel use 
by 5 to 10 percent. Eco-driving systems recognize driving behavior and provide the driver with on-trip advice and post-trip feedback. These systems hold the promise of reducing emissions by 5 to 20 percent. The two highest potential infrastructure measures are traffic signal coordination and parking guidance. Traffic signal coordination and parking guidance systems are already in widespread use in many cities. But giving drivers real-time advice on traffic signals and guidance to find the parking space could produce a further 10% savings in CO2 emissions. Today, new vehicles, those less than one year old, represent only 5% of the total EU car fleet. The fleet's average age is 9.7 years and it's rising. With this in mind, the study's findings make a clear case for a faster renewal of the fleet so that we can bring more vehicles with the latest technologies to the street faster. But connected vehicles and faster fleet renewal will not be enough. So the ASEOA is also calling on policy makers to invest more in appropriate infrastructure improvements. Policy makers also need to ensure smooth coordination between the different players involved, such as road authorities and car park operators. ITS systems clearly offer many benefits and opportunities, but they also raise some challenges. They rely on the collection, processing, and use of data from different sources, including the vehicle itself. This raises the issue of protecting personal data. Recognizing these concerns, ASEA's board this morning adopted a statement setting out five principles of data protection to which we as an industry will adhere. These principles are, we will be transparent, informing our customers clearly of what data we will use and how. We will give customers choice, sharing their data only on the basis of consent, a legal contract, or in order to fulfill legal obligations. We will always take data protection into account from the outset using the principle of privacy by design. We will maintain data security to protect customers' information from unintended uses. And we will process personal data in a proportionate manner, only using the necessary data and keeping them no longer than they are needed for their purpose. Data protection is an issue automakers take very seriously. We are committed to providing our customers with a high level of protection and maintaining their trust. This is essential if ITS and the connected car are to fulfill their full potential. I will now turn the stage over to Mr. Mayer to explain the Ertico study in more details Thank you for your attention, and we will discuss further during the Q&A session. Bonjour, Mr. President. Chris Scott, meine Damen und Herren. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here. I see there's a lot of passion about automobiles. My passion is about connectivity, exchanging information, and providing services to people to make mobility smarter, safer, and more environmentally friendly. Ertico Partnership is a public-private partnership where we have European member states in the partnership, we have users' associations, we have cities, we have the industry in this membership, it's 116 partners. And the purpose is to work together to develop and deploy intelligent transport systems in Europe. Now what are the challenges which can be addressed 
by intelligent transport systems. And here you see a variety of challenges. It is about the demographic change, uh, change, it's about safety issues, it's about urbanization, and very important, it's also about climate change. And today, the study which I introduced to you is about reducing CO2 emissions via two different types of applications. One are in vehicle applications and the other one are infrastructure based. And in 2011, an expert group from the European Commission, they made an estimate concerning the potential of intelligent transport systems if they are deployed between 2010 and 2020, what they can make as a change with respect to some important policy goals, reducing fatalities, uh, reducing congestion and reducing CO2 emissions. And here the estimate was 20% for transport. Now, why is the Article Partnership in a good position to make such a study? Because the Article Partnership and ASEA is one of the partners within the Article Partnership, has engaged in many activities, many projects to study what is the potential of CO2 emissions to reduce, uh, of ITS to reduce CO2 emissions. We are also engaged in a thematic paper on this issue and we are involved in activities from the iMobility Forum which is um, led by the European Commission. As, uh, as I said already, there are two aspects in this study. Applications which are in the vehicle and applications which come from the infrastructure side and I will introduce the applications later. Now this study has not produced new data. This study is based on existing studies. We looked at what is already existing in studies in the context of field tests. That means that the applications were tested in a real-world environment or sometimes also simulations. So we gathered, we collected this data and we analyzed them and brought them into this report. Then we also had the Ertigo partners who supported us in developing this study, also ASEA members and also other stakeholders. Now the first one, and maybe one of the most effective ones, is eco-navigation. Eco-navigation means that it's more than the navigation which you might have now in your vehicle, which already gives you guidance how you go to A to B, it also if it's a dynamic system, it gives you already information about the traffic situation. But here it also gives you information about what is the most fuel-efficient way to go from A to B. And if you use this eco-navigation, then the estimate is that the potential of CO2 savings is between 5% and 10%. This is already quite substantial. Then eco-driving. Eco-driving serves the purpose that the system is providing information, some guidance, some support to the driver to drive in a more eco-friendly way. To anticipate better. For instance, if there is a traffic light which is red, then it doesn't make sense you are speeding and then you stop. Drive cautiously towards the traffic light. Don't accelerate too fast. Don't accelerate too slow. Both can lead to high fuel consumption. So it gives advice to the driver. Here, the potential CO2 savings vary from 5 to 20%. Now, don't take these, when it's 5 to 20%, I think there's quite a spread between it. Don't take it like, this is because the measurements are not correct. But the reason for this uh, spread lies in the fact that the situations are very different when you measure in the context of urban uh, transport you get a different result than when you measure in the context more of motorways when you have a situation where there are lots of hills you have a different estimate than when it's flat that is the reason for the spread <coughs> in these figures other ITS measures in car 
where eco-adaptive cruise control, that means that you have your adaptive cruise control, but it, is, it has a, a strategy which avoids that it goes often into the brake or accelerates, so it's a bit more eco-friendly. And then also intelligent speed adaptation, that only means that you get information about the speed limits into your car. There, the potential for CO2 savings, which were measured, were very low. Traffic signal control. This means that you're on a road, you have traffic uh, lights, and you get something like a green wave, and you get information about the speed recommended so that you have the green wave. This you see already in many cities uh, in Europe. There the CO2 savings are estimated to be between 3% and 7%. Green light optimized speed advisory. This goes a step further than what I showed before with the green wave. It gives you always advice with respect to how to drive in the context of the traffic lights. For instance, that a traffic light will become green, let's say, in, uh, in 20 seconds, then you get this information. You get information about how to approach the traffic light, and you get also the information which you had already before, if you, you can achieve a green wave if you drive now 30. So it gives you additional information, and the information is provided to you within the car. The green wave very often is, uh, is infrastructure-based. So here there was a large potential and it's between 15 and 20 percent. But please take note that when you eco have eco-navigation for instance, there you have the CO2 reduction potential throughout your journey because the system is working throughout your journey. If you have green light optimized speed advisory, the system is only working when there are traffic lights. So only there, in these circumstances, then you have this potential. Other infrastructure ITS measures studied were uh, parking guidance. That's my personal favorite. I would like to have one. Uh, and there, the CO2 savings are measured between 7 and uh, 10 percent, and variable speed limits, it's only between uh, 1 and 2.5 percent. Now, here you see an overview concerning all these findings which we have. And maybe two comments. The first one is that here we can only report about applications which are already tested. In the future there will be other ITS applications which also lead to CO2 savings but have not yet had these tests. These are the most mature ones. Secondly, you cannot add the different potential CO2 savings with each other. You cannot pile on it. One reason, because they are only valid in certain situations of your uh, driving experience. And the other thing is, sometimes they are complementary. Conclusions. First conclusion, there is significant, there's a significant potential for CO2 reduction of various ITS solutions. Secondly, potential for CO2 reduction varies substantially according to circumstances. Topography, if it's in an urban um, mobility context, if it's highly congested, the applications have a different impact in different circumstances. Realization requires action by multiple stakeholders. This is something where there is really a need for an integrated approach where all the different stakeholders make their contribution so that it can work. There is not one stakeholder who can do all the measures which are ne necessary to realize this. And maybe also very importantly is that there are already now methodologies to measure the impact of the different applications with a high accuracy. That means, for instance, it would be possible also to introduce uh, schemes like eco-innovation in this context because it's measurable what the different applications bring. 
So thank you very much for your attention and if you really want to go in all the details concerning how this was done, you have to go to a genius which is called Andrew Winder and he's working for me and he knows much more about it. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. So now we can open the floor uh, for your questions. Just please note that this is an ASEA press conference, so as usual, we cannot take company-specific questions, but of course, I'm more than happy to welcome your um, industry-wide questions. So if you raise your hand, my colleague will bring you the mic. Uh, just please state your name and media outlet. Uh, we can start here. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Olaf Storbeck with Reuters Breaking Views, uh, the financial commentary service of Reuters. I have two questions. One for Mr. Meyer regarding the percentage saving potential. How do I have to interpret them? Is this just the 10%, for instance, of the green racing, when I'm riding, uh, when I'm driving down the road, which has these traffic lights? So on, on this specific trip, I could save 10%. Um, and all these are in, in, interpret are to be read in, in this way. All these numbers. Probably so. The, the overall impact will be much lower than probably on on, on fleet consumption and traffic consumption. You have only the um, the impact when the application is running. So that means, for instance, in the context of the traffic lights, only when there are traffic lights in this context, you have these reductions. Parking, for instance, only when you are looking for a parking space, then you will have this impact and these CO2 reductions. But that also means that, for instance, uh, the eco-navigation uh, is uh, very powerful, yeah, because that works throughout the journey, and then it's for the whole journey. Okay, my, my second question is to Mr. Gorn. Um, I, I would be interested in your view on, on the kind of post-2021 world regarding emission standards. I think it's still in the balance how, how the policy will evolve. What are you expecting? What are you advocating for? Uh, well, uh, you know, our, our position is, uh, is very clear, is uh, obviously a lot of things are going to happen in COP21, or hopefully at least, uh, to give some kind of visibility about what are the goals that the world is taking in terms of limitation of emissions, and what are the contributions from the different parts who are part of the problem in order to try to put it under control. Uh, 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 so, and we are expecting somehow that, uh, anyway, from everything coming from the preparation of COP21, is that the goals are going to be a long-term goal first, to make sure that everybody uh, gets prepared and investing and putting whatever the modus operandi is necessary in order to reach them. So the first objective is to make sure that the goal is give enough time in order for everybody to converge. And we really welcome this because we think uh, in order to be successful, everybody needs visibility because this is going to require a lot of changes to take place. So this is our first requirement. Just make sure that the goal gives enough time for people to converge toward this goal. Uh, that's number one. And second, uh, that it is an integrated approach. Uh, you know, uh, CO2 emission uh, has to take in consideration all the emissions of CO2 by definition. And it could not be focused only on what we can really measure or what we can control. It has to be really wider if we really want to make a difference at the level on the planet. And when we're talking about integrated, we're talking not only integrated in terms of transportation along with all the other sector emitting CO2. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to be extremely tough on one sector and be completely lax on another sector, because at the end of the day, the results is going to be mediocre. So we're going to have to be an integrated approach. So everybody contributing to CO2 need to bring an effort that should be done. That's number two. But it also should be integrated within the transportation sector. And that's, I think, the object of uh, my introduction, that uh, playing only on uh, the new cars 
is a very small part of the equation. Uh, well, obviously, we understand that new cars will contribute and is, are contributing. But this is, uh, in terms of emission uh, for transportation, it's a very small part. Because what contributes is the whole park. And in the whole park, it's not only that, you know, in the EU, we're talking about a car park, which is 10 years uh, in average, uh, 10 years old. But you can imagine that in other countries, it's much more than 10. It's 15, it's 20. And you can imagine that having cars which are 15 years old, 20 years old, on the road with cars which are Euro 6 or etc. <laughs> Again, uh, we, 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 we would like and we want to advocate without being suspected or being biased an integrated approach. Something where really we take emission because at the end of the day what we want is the output of the system is limiting the CO2 emission and then from the emissions go back to the origin and try to see who can contribute what so we can get we can get results. Today the situation is we are extremely tough on small, relatively small part of the contributors and in a certain way much more lax on other emitters. I mean, that's the way it works. The result is CO2 emission is increasing and the, 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 the heating of the planet continues to increase. If we really want results, we need to start by not from the emissions, but from the output, and then from the output, go back and try to put, no matter how difficult it is, put control on the emission, and this is an integrated approach, and we are all favorable to the integrated approach. That these are the position of the, of the industry. The industry has a lot of technology today in order to face, uh, you know, a big part of the challenge which is going, going to be its part, it's okay. But frankly, it's such a frustration to see that we're putting so much technology and so much effort uh, obtaining uh, very strong results and seeing that near us there are a lot of emissions uh, which, which are not contributing. Because at the end of the day, if you make an effort, you want at least to have the satisfaction to see something changing at the level of the planet, but if you don't see the change, then <laughs> your efforts, uh, you know, in a certain way, do not make too much, too much. Sense. That's the position of the of the industry. I, I want you to think, okay, you know, these guys don't want to do that. No, we are, we are making a lot of efforts. We will continue to make efforts. You know, there is a strong competition between all the car makers. They're all bringing different technologies. That's not the issue. The issue, we want this to serve a purpose. We want to make sure that the purpose can be seen. And the purpose is reducing the CO2 emission worldwide. And this cannot be linked to one activity and avoid another. It has to be integrated. So that, that's our position. And a question from the lady just there, and then one over here. Thank you for taking my question. Annika Ra from the Gem News via DPA. Uh, Mr. Gohn, I have a question on this data protection commitment. How binding is this commitment? Like, what will you do if some ASEA member tries to give customers data to third parties? Like, is this how? Can you describe how binding? Yes, yeah, I, I, I can. Uh, first, I, I'm probably gonna leave the floor to Eric, who has been working very hard with the representative of the all, all the car makers, and who came this morning with this proposal that the board approved unanimously, the board represented by all the CEO of, of, of the car makers, to tell you that there is a unanimous concern from all the car makers to really make sure that nothing can be done which can breach the trust that the consumers have towards us. You know, for, for us it's a, it's, a, it's a very big stake, but, but maybe I, I can leave the floor to tell you how we got to that. But first. Thank you for the question. Uh, clearly, you know, this is a voluntary commitment to start with. Yeah. Uh, we know there is legislation in Europe about data protection. We take that into account. This provides the, the minimal framework. But we want to go on top and make sure that there's clarity 
also versus users, consumers in Europe, on what kind of principles uh, OEMs want to respect when it comes to data protection. And so those principles again have been reviewed by the board this morning. And in the board we have 15 companies, which were mentioned uh, before. So they all subscribed to these principles. Uh, and so we intend, of course, to uh, behave uh, accordingly. All right. That's that's the declaration of intent on our side, and also uh, something which we want to put very clear uh, versus you know the uh, users that we are committed to respect the data uh, which users provide us. The data protection will be uh, a prime intent from all uh, OEMs. So if your question is, is it just uh, something which is done? No, it, it, it is a real en engagement uh, of all the industry to say this is serious. And it is serious because at, this, at the end of the day, it's our own interest to make sure that the trust with our customers uh, is never broken through the process of connectivity around the product that we all agree is going to be the main technical challenge of the years to come, is our car is going to be much more connected, uh, we're going to have more and more devices of autonomous transportation, and this process should be really a reason not of concern of our customers, but on the contrary of comfort, of safety, and of delight. Question here, and then afterwards, then back. Hello, oh, I'm from Automotive News. Um, just a follow-up question on CO2. The Paris conference is one, it's on a path um, to an agreement. Regardless of what happens in Paris, the EU has its own separate path. Um, at what stage are we now on setting the post-2025 Targets and will there be a delay to 2030? I'm also trying to figure out what if in Paris everyone says no, we don't want clean air. The EU is still it has its still <laughs> it has its own pathway and it will continue on it. Is that correct? So it's two questions. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, Eric is involved into all the uh, details of the negotiation going on. But but let me tell you. Let's suppose we come with no solution in COP21. And everybody says, you know what, we can't agree. Okay? It might happen. Yeah, yeah it might happen. But, but, but what do you think is going to be the impact uh, on everybody? Not okay. Okay. No, no, but because at the end of the day, what, you, what we want is all the actors uh, be motivated. And it's very important. Motivation is very important. No matter what, I mean, companies need motivation. Uh, people working in company need motivation. It's going to be much more easier to motivate people toward achieving goals when these goals are within a collective effort, global effort, in order to reach it. If, if, you, if, if you come up from COP21 and, you know, let's suppose we take this scenario where there is no agreement, <laughs> frankly, then uh, uh, CO2 uh, emission and regulation uh, look more like a kind of punishment than a motivating goal on which everybody... So I think we, we will do anything we can and we will influence everything we can so we can get a result from COP21. Because we're talking about the problem and it's about time that we act against it and we act in a way which is going to get a result. So we are expecting and do everything we can in order to get results. Now when we get results, obviously these results are going to have to be compatible with all the efforts which are going to be required. That's why a collective goal is so important, because then each industry and each activity can put its own contribution within this global purpose of reducing CO2 emission. Now, you're right. If there is no result, there will still be a regulation in terms of, of CO2. And now, uh, maybe I can give the floor to Eric, who's going to tell you exactly where we are. Uh, building upon what Mr. Gohn said, the European Commission has been very clear, and especially Commissioner Cagnetti, who is in charge of this uh, dossier, 
that he waits first for the outcome of COP21 before starting and engaging in proposals. So it's in line with also what, what we have been talking uh, uh, recently. So the Commission is expecting to come up with a communication on the subject in the first half of next year, following COP21, taking into account the outcome of COP21, and new re legislative uh, proposals on new targets. Frankly, what we understand, the earliest we expect at the second half of uh, next calendar year, uh, because clearly the Commission will uh, come up, indeed, with proposals. We currently have targets to meet as an industry by 2020, so the 95 grams, uh, and so the question mark is what's next. And on that question, the Commission intends to provide an answer by coming up with proposals in the course of next year, but again after COP21 and taking into account the outcome of COP21. Is there any discussion about a delay until 2030? No, yeah, but, but you see, the, the point, I don't think it's a question of delay. Uh, I mean, we cannot say that if we have a goal for 2030, there's a delay compared to a goal in 2025. This, let's suppose that in COP21, there is an agreement on an objective in 2030 or in 2040 or in 2050, no matter what it is. Then it's much easier than to say, okay, recognizing this overall objective, let's say in 2040, now we are talking about milestones which is a completely different equation. But fixing objective with a date, which is completely disconnected from an overall objective at the level of the planet, uh, is going to create the question of what is the rationality of the efforts which is going to be being required. Again, we, we are uh, strongly uh, uh, talking about integrated approach, because same thing, I mean, if you just regulate strictly on the new cars, it's, it's, it's just it's just a uh, you know a wasted effort if you don't look at the whole sector of transportation and then if near the sector of transportation you don't look at the whole emissions of CO2. This is a very strong position of the industry. Again, we will do whatever we will be asked to do, but at the same time we just want to make sure that our efforts and our investments serve a purpose and the purpose that everybody can measure at the end. We had a question uh, from the gentleman at the end who's waiting for a while. So, uh, thank you, Jack Ewing from the New York Times. I, I have a question going back to data protection. Um, uh, all of your members are OEMs. Uh, how are you going to uh, enforce this uh, promise that you've made given that there are other companies obviously trying to get into that data, data space in, in cars? How, how are you going to deal with that? Well, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good question. Which me this means that at the end of the day, you know, we decide who gets access to the car. I mean, we, we are deciding who is our suppliers, who are deciding what tech company is going to be working with us, etc. Et and we have the choice. It means that in the decision that the car makers will be doing in selecting suppliers and partners, uh, we will make sure that this engagement that we are taking will be respected by all the parties. So, uh, and this is uh, extremely important because it's going to become in a certain way contractual, you know. It's, uh, we are taking uh, as a company a kind of commitment to protect data and making sure that we have no surprise in this matter. It's obvious that all our suppliers, all our partners, all the contracted parties which are contributing to the final, uh, to, to the final goal are also engaged into the same uh, into the same principle. We have it, by the way, with our suppliers for many other engagement that the industry have uh, in other fields. You know what we take as engagement is something that, in a certain way, uh, prolong to the extended enterprise. In a certain way, all the people working with us. I think we can take one more question. Uh, the gentleman here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Silvers with the Wall Street Journal. I wanted to return for a second to the emissions question and of course with the premise that 95 grams and setting that for a certain year may be an arbitrary number, but that is what it is. And a lot of people will argue that um, while it's very helpful, all the measures that can be taken that were outlined in this study, 
that the only way that we're really going to get there is with the big increase in electric vehicles and, and going down that sort of path. I was wondering if you could uh, both comment on that. And also, I was wondering if you could give us an idea of who these other emitters are that you think um, maybe could be leaned on a little bit more. Yeah, I, you know, we, we, there is uh, obvious studies showing where is it, it, CO2 emissions are coming from. Um, you know, we obviously concentrating our effort on transportation because we're a big player on transportation. But you can access, you know, broadly known information about what are the other sectors emitting. So I don't, I don't want to hear pinpoint any particular sector, but what, what we are talking about is if we really are serious about the output, which is CO2 emitted, we just need to make sure that we have an integrated approach where everybody brings his own contribution. It cannot be only 30% or 20% or whatever uh, percentage of the emitters being, uh, you know, uh, in uh, a very clear milestones of reducing of reducing emission. Uh, but the other sector, you know them. Uh, there are many studies showing what are the different sectors, and we hope that. COP21 is going to address all this issue. But, but the second most important thing that we are, what we are focusing is if we take the transportation system, uh, we just want to make sure that we, we, we don't only focus on the easy stuff. And what is the easy stuff is new cars. Okay, so you're just going to say, okay, you know, new cars need to be 90, 70, 80, whatever. Okay, but if, if this is a very small portion of the emission, then the rationality of the effort is questionable. Uh, why do you want to continue to dig into something representing 2%, uh, 3%, 4% of the emission globally? Because you're talking about new cars. Uh, what you have in 90 or 95% where the efforts are not clear or the milestones are not clear. That's our, that's our logic. So again, no matter what is the objective that will be set, uh, obviously, the industry has shown already that it is it will deliver on its commitments. Uh, but at the same time, we worry about the final output, and this is the object of our discussion today. If, if I if I may add to this, just to respond also to some of the other questions you raised. First of all, okay, we as an automotive industry are a non-ETS sector. If I look at automotive versus other non ETS sectors, we contribute annually to CO2 emission reduction at around 5%. Non ETS, other non ETS sector around 2%. So we are already ahead of the curve in that respect. One. Second, electrification. Indeed, in general, we touch upon electrification, but let's look at alternative powertrains in general, will be in, indeed another important factor uh, to contribute, to continue contributing to further CO2 emission reductions. But again, in the discussion on CO2 post 2020, Again, very important for us is going to be that we look at what worked and didn't work on alternative powertrains and what needs to be done in order to further encourage more uptake of these alternative powertrains. It's clear that all manufacturers have invested heavily on alternative powertrains. Frankly, if you walk around the motor show here, you see the diversity in everybody's portfolio, including addressing alternative powertrains. The market uptake continues to be quite low. One of the reasons is, of course, there is a pricing thing, there is a cost thing, uh, there is an infrastructure uh, element here. So it definitely in our discussions, we are calling upon member states to ensure they continue investing in the right recharging infrastructure to make these alternative powertrains also more appealing uh, to the man in the street. Okay, I'm afraid we're really going to have to close it there. Both Mr. Yonart and Mr. Gohn have other engagements now.